2FA is essential for securing your accounts. It's where you add a second verification method for your account so that even if someone gets access to your password, there's still a barrier stopping them from accessing your account. One popular 2FA method is an authenticator app, but some of the most well-known authenticator apps are actually collecting more data about your activities than you may realize. In this video, we're gonna dive into what kind of information they're collecting, how to give these apps less information when you use them, and we're also going to explore some more private 2FA apps that are also open source. Let's quickly recap how 2FA authenticators or TOTP apps work. Basically, in your account settings, you might have an option to add 2FA via an authenticator app. When you select this option, the website will give you a secret seed, either in the form of a long string of digits or in the form of a QR code that has that long string of digits embedded in it. You need to somehow enter the code into the app and there are two options either you enter it manually or you scan the code. Talal and Tommy form the security and privacy research duo MISC and they explain to us that your 2FA app will take this seed, combine it with the current time and feed it into an algorithm that spits out a new short code every 30 seconds or so which you'll type into the account website. Meanwhile the account you're securing like your Twitter or email will also have a copy of that secret on their servers. When you try to authenticate, they'll feed their secret into an algorithm on their end combined with the current time and also spit out a code. If the codes match, then you're in. If not, it would just reject your call. The 2FA app servers shouldn't ever get access to your secret seed. Really, all the app should be doing is just some computation locally on the device involving your seed and the current time and spitting out codes for you. The app can functionally operate perfectly without internet. But it turns out that some 2FA apps are doing more than this, sending all kinds of information back to their servers. In our last video, we showed you some malware 2FA apps that were actually stealing your secret seed so that hackers could access your 2FA codes too. In this video, we're going to talk about a different threat apps that aren't stealing your codes, but are collecting extra data around your activities, which a privacy conscious person should be aware of. It is pretty much industry standard at this point that each app has its own analytics system. They often use common services such as Google Firebase, uh, there's App Center from Microsoft. These analytics aren't necessarily nefarious, but are they appropriate for something like a 2FA app? When it comes to security tools like authenticator apps, anything we would consider to be pretty private, we don't want to see analytics in it. And if there are analytics, we want the option to disable analytics. For me, it's very sensitive that the app would send, for example, the services that you're dealing with. So if you have an Amazon account, Twitter account, Facebook account, and then it would link the services that you use with your identity. The MISC team analyzed the network traffic from the most popular 2FA apps to find out what information each was collecting and which app was the most private. We would see if the app is sharing more information, more analytics than it is required. Let's start with Authy, a popular 2FA authenticator app that it turns out collects a lot of information from you. To be able to use Authy, you have to supply your email. This is the first thing that they request when you open the app for the first time. You need to give your phone number and you need to verify your phone number. And when you create your account, they give you an ID called S Auth ID. The user can see that this ID belongs to them. After the verification, of course, this ID is going to be tied with your email and your phone number. Then there's the analytics that's sent to all these servers, and there's a lot. Device information, like device type, OS version, but there's also more sensitive information. They are collecting information about the services that you use, and they know which accounts types you already have. Google is the service of the token that we scanned during this experiment. And of course, they tie this information about the account you're using, whether it's Google or Twitter or something else, with your user ID. This data analytics that we see in here, this is not anonymous because it is associated with the SID and the SID is associated with the email and the phone number, which are already personal information. They are able to keep track of what their own users are doing within their own apps. We don't think security tools such as authenticators should be using analytics. And if the vendor really wants to add analytics, we believe it should be anonymous. In this case, mm -hmm. we can see that these analytics events do contain a unique identifier 
that can be tied back to the user's account with Authy at least give the option for users to disable analytics. And Authy doesn't. There was no option in the app to turn this off. Now, do we think that Authy is using this information for some grand conspiracy of linking all the platforms someone uses together in a giant centralized database? Probably not. If I were to speculate, they just really want to know overall, what are the more, more popular accounts? How are users using their app and so on. Typically mm -hmm. analytics, it's not malicious. It's just something that is pretty much industry standard at this point. We just have strong opinions about which apps should be using analytics and how analytics should be anonymous and not user identifiable. But even if there is no grand conspiracy, I'd prefer that an app not know which platforms I'm using or what my phone number and email address are. Authy is a very talkative app, meaning it sends data back to its servers frequently. If you're privacy conscious, it might not be the best app for you. Now let's look at Microsoft Authenticator, another popular 2FA app. The first thing to note about Microsoft Authenticator is that they mandate you allow Microsoft to collect your data before you can use their Authenticator. If you decline to share your data, they tell you that you can't use the app. Not a great start. So what data do they want from you? There's information about your device, OS version, they're even collecting which mobile operator you use. Are they mapping who your cell provider is? Yes. They're using something called App Center to collect this data, which is an analytics tool developed by Microsoft. This is one of the standard things that App Center collects. It does collect carry information. There's also general usage data, as in your behavior, each button clicked, how you use the app. And on top of that, Microsoft too collects which platforms you're using. You can see here in the analytics Proton, which is the account linked in this test. Microsoft is also contradictory regarding whether all these analytics are personally identifiable. According to the app's privacy label, data collected is linked to your real identity. But then in the app set Settings, it says that the data collected is non-identifying. Let's take a look at the actual identifiers they collect so that we can figure out which one is true. First, there's the SID, which is an ID that changes with each session. That would suggest that it might be randomly generated and not personally identifiable. But they also collect something called your shared device identifier, which is a persistent ID that would allow them to aggregate analytics across sessions. If Microsoft links the shared device identifier ID to the user's identity, then all these analytics become identifiable. But as you notice, there is an option for you to turn data sharing off. What happens if we toggle that off? We switched the analytics off and we ran the experiment again, and we saw that this information is being sent nonetheless. Now, the amount of data was reduced. For example, the app stopped sending general usage data, like she clicked here, scrolled here, etc. And they stopped sending which platform you're using, like Proton, Twitter, etc. But they are indeed still sharing data, like your device information, your phone carrier, and they're even still collecting your persistent shared device identifier. That was the interesting part about the Microsoft Authenticator because you switch the usage data off, yet it sends this thing. These apps are still sending analytics even though the user has opted out from analytics. This is still a lot of information for no analytics. So if you're one of those crazy people who thinks that opting out of data sharing should actually opt you out of data to sharing, Microsoft Authenticator probably isn't the best choice for you. Now let's look at Google Authenticator. This was a tricky one. When analyzing the app traffic to the MISC team, it appeared that Google was not collecting activity from within the app. Your behavior inside the app was not being communicated to Google servers. We couldn't detect anything about what kind of service you were scanning or how many services. For example, if you add multiple accounts, one from Amazon, the other one from Google, another from Twitter, Mastodon, it would not share this information with Google. Google did send some things like crash reports, but other than that... We were surprised to see that actually it doesn't seem to send anything. Indeed, surprising behavior for a company that is renowned for collecting as much data about users as it can. And it also seems to contradict what is self-disclosed in their privacy label. If you were to look at the privacy label on the App Store, they do mention that they do link usage data and identifiers and diagnostics to your account. And hence to a user's identity. But Exodus Privacy confirmed that they too found no trackers in Google Authenticator. They did say that they did a static analysis of Google Authenticator's APK, which stands for Android Package Kit and is the file format used by Android to distribute and install applications. And in this analysis found tracker signatures, but this is not proof of activity of these trackers. On the other side of things, the application could contain trackers 
features that Exodus Privacy doesn't know about yet. They do associate this thing with a cookie ID, which is shared among all the Google apps that you have installed in, on your iPhone. And there might be other tracking methods that we're missing. There are ways to do this, especially if you have multiple Google apps installed on your phone. So while Google Authenticator actually seems okay, tread carefully because Google has a terrible track record when it comes to tracking users. Now let's look at some more private alternatives for your 2FA app. We explored a bunch of open source options to see how they compare. Free OTP is a popular open source TOTP app developed by Red Hat. It's available for both Android and iOS devices and supports multiple accounts. Free OTP is available on the Google Play Store, Fdroid and Apple App Store. There's also a fork of it called Free OTP Plus that allows you to export or import settings to Google Drive, has a more modern UI and also allows biometric or pin authentication to secure the app. Exodus Privacy said that they found zero trackers in free OTP, and the MISC team confirmed that they couldn't detect any network traffic. According to the privacy policy of free OTP, they do not collect any data from your mobile device, and permissions are very narrow in how they're used. Free OTP seems like a solid choice for an authenticator app. Next, we have Aegis Authenticator, another open source TOTP app. This is only available for Android, but has some good qualities, including a built-in QR code scanner. Aegis Authenticator is available on both the Google Play Store and F-Droid, and the TOTP secrets are stored in an encrypted vault for added security. Aegis also has biometric support and integration with Guardian Project's Ripple, which allows you to delete the vault if you hit the panic button, which is a really cool feature. Exodus Privacy reports that they found zero trackers in Aegis, and the MISC team confirmed in their testing that Aegis doesn't send any trackers. The Aegis Privacy Policy states that they don't collect any data from your device, and that their usage of the camera permission is narrow. Aegis is another solid choice for an authenticator app if you're on Android. And OTP is another free and open source TOTP app. And as its name implies, it is also Android exclusive. One thing to note is that it's no longer actively maintained, as the developer doesn't have time, but many still say that it's a good choice for an authenticator app, and it also has zero trackers and doesn't collect any data. Use unmaintained code at your own risk. We also looked at 2FAs, another open source two-factor authenticator that is available for both iOS and Android. But according to Exodus Privacy Reports, it does contain trackers. The MISC team confirmed this, that it sends, for example, frequent Google Analytics data. But according to them, it's nothing really sensitive. In terms of all the different 2FA product choices, now that you have more information about how they do or don't use your data, you can pick the app that you feel best aligns with your personal privacy and security stance. And this is gonna vary from person to person. Some people will choose choose to go with the most well-known products because they want to avoid any lesser-known apps that might be scams. If they're not too bothered by analytics data, then it's not necessarily a lower security option for them. If you're more careful, you really don't want any analytics data, then yes, that's something like an open source solution that you trust, that you vetted, that others have vetted would be a better option because you know that they're not sending analytics data because you can actually see what the app is doing. And just because something is open source, it doesn't make it immediately trusted. So don't just choose an app because it says that it's open source. Make sure that it's well vetted and has a good reputation. There are many open source uh, options out there. The thing is that once you publish your app to the store, it's very hard to verify that the code which is open source is the same as the code that you submitted to the store. The final part of this video is on how to decrease the amount of data you send off, regardless of which app you choose. When you first input into your 2FA app the string of random digits that is your secret seed, you can choose to type it in manually or to scan a code that has the seed embedded in it. That secret seed... It's long, it's hard to type and stuff, so this is why they use QR code. It's very convenient to just scan with the camera and then you get the seed to your app. So if you trust the app and you want to let it access your camera, scanning might be a good option. But there's actually all kinds of other data that might have been added to that QR code. You can't tell just by looking at a QR code what data or instructions are actually embedded in it. But if you really want to, you can actually just use any QR code scanner app and see what's actually in the QR code. In a typical QR code for one of these 2FA apps, there's usually standard information about your account that will allow the app to easily autofill the descriptions. Your username normally is included inside the QR code. Your data and login screen and service and issuer and all these things, they are inside the, the QR code. This is optional data for you so that you know that this seed that you're scanning to which account 
account it belongs and which issuer has issued this code. But you can change it, you can delete it, it's no problem. It is really optional. So if you're using an app that you know will send this information back to their servers, you can actually edit the information in the QR code and create a new one before scanning it into the app. Or another option is just typing in the seed manually, in which case no other information will be auto-filled. You'll have to type it in manually too. When you enter the code manually, they prompt you to ask you what is this code for because you would be confused if you only have the secrets. They do pile up after a while of using them. By inputting this information manually, you can choose exactly what information you want the app to have. In theory, if you have your own way of distinguishing between the, the various codes and the various accounts that you have, that would be one way to obfuscate that this code belongs to Twitter, that code belongs to Instagram and so on instead of having that information in the QR code itself. This would result in a marginal difference in privacy, but that difference might be important to privacy conscious people who choose to opt out of this data collection. But importantly, manually inputting your seed also allows you to easily make a copy of that seed, which is essential in case you ever lose your 2FA app. So I highly recommend manual input anyway. So here are our main takeaways when using 2FA. One, you should absolutely have 2FA on your accounts whenever you can. Two, be careful which 2FA app you download because some of them are outright malware. Three, out of the legitimate apps, you have the option to choose one that doesn't collect data about you. And there are a lot of established and well-regarded options for you to choose from. Four, whichever app you choose, make sure you download the right thing. There are lots of copycats out there that will pay to be the first option in search results. When in doubt, find the real app from their legitimate website first and link to the app store from there. And five, Wherever possible, opt to use a security key as your 2FA method instead of an app, because security keys are the most secure form of 2FA out there. We have a whole video explaining how they work if you want to take a look. 2FA is an essential part of your privacy and security setup, and it's important people know that they can make more private choices with these. If you were to ask them, do you want to be tracked? Most people would say no, they don't want to be tracked. By knowing which tech in our lives is tracking us and collecting our data, we can make more informed decisions about which products and services we decide to use. You can make the choice that's right for you. NBTV is funded by community support. If you'd like to support our free educational content, please visit nbtv.media slash support, or check out our ebook, The Beginner's Introduction to Privacy, which also supports the channel. Or even just liking, sharing, commenting on, and subscribing to our content also really helps us. Thank you so much for watching through till the end. Click here to receive your access code to Twitter. Well, I don't remember requesting an access code to Twitter, but let me click on this random link anyway. Ah!